and you're good to go. Okay. Let's see if I can There's an area. Laser there it is. Well, that's no, not a laser pointer, but you can advance the slides. On a TV screen, okay. laser pointers disappear. Okay, that's fine. So we don't have so, one just for that. Is there a little arrow? Can I push up for a mouse? No, but you can do it here. Okay. You'd have to do it right here okay, if you wanted to do like what you're talking about. Okay, yeah. I just did it right yeah, you can just. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Sure. Structure-based as drug discovery, the whole computation about yeah. it. how do you design work? Yeah. yeah, I will um, put that in the talk. Uh, yeah. Hey, Bob. Um, I'm making note of note to myself. Yeah, I think there's some people here on campus that, and maybe even in Southern Switch, that can mm. do something like this. Looks like it's a little
They wanted to drive about a mile and a half ago uh, away from the campsite that you reserved. There's been an aggressive bear sighting. So in the end, before they allow you to go, you need to watch the bear video anyway, that kind of stuff. And I thought a mile and a half is not that far away for a bear. So we cooked at the parking lot, and then we had, I brushed my teeth. So children sure only took our sleeping bags and fancy. That freaked me out. So I was singing the whole time. We pitched our tent, and so I, I didn't sleep a wink because every little noise I thought it was a bear coming for us. And next morning, Mike was like, working at the time. He went, oh, 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 this is the best sleep ever. I got hit you. I was holy watch all night. Next time I want to have a tent with two exits. Because they're coming on. I want to be able to get out the other side. I had my bear spray right there. It, we never saw it. But it was, um, my adrenaline level was quite high. Yeah. I got a chance to visit a big cat rescue place up in Wisconsin. So if they if they catch you keeping a, a tiger in your house, they send you to jail. They send a tiger to this place. Mm -hmm. So I mean, they had tigers and lions and leopards and mountain lions and all kinds of things. Just out in the middle of cornfields. <laughs> yeah. It was weird. But. I have not realized just how big tigers actually are. <laughs> yeah. And there were two things about that, that trip that freaked me out. One was that there was a woman in our in our group mm -hmm. who was in the chair. And all the cats were very focused. <laughs> what do you uh, that, that's the interesting thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and then we were walking along, and there was this one in, in, enclosure next to it. And there was like some chicken wire, it looked like, it was like heavy duty chicken. Yeah. 12 feet tall. Yeah. Probably a tiger can go over it if he wants to. Probably motivation. <laughs> but you know, so the tiger is off in the back corner. Yeah. So we're like, okay, well, we're never talking to the guy. Mm -hmm. and walking along. Suddenly, what kind of reptile part of my brain goes off uh, like danger? Yeah. I turn around and right here, <laughs> no cover, broad daylight, mm -hmm. he snuck up on me. He's wow. like on the other side of the fence. Mm -hmm. He's like literally a foot and a half away from me, just yeah. smiling. At me. <laughs> and I was like, hey, this man. Wow. I'm I just absolutely silent. Mm -hmm. Those guys are cool, but more cool. We do have those senses. Yeah, I, yeah I, I mean, it would have been much too late. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but not for the other people in your party. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You only have to add one the others. Also, the thing I didn't know, mountain lions are the only big cats that fur. Mmm. Oh, yeah. Really? You know? Yeah. They fur like chainsaws. Mm -hmm. They had a brain like broad chicken legs. Yeah. That feed through the fence. Uh -huh. the cats. So, yeah, the mountain lions were really into that. Mm. Um, the other cats were too, but they yeah, they just don't hurt. They make a kind of a chopping noise. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of, well, a lot of frequent interactions with mountain bikers and mountain lions. It, it was better than adults. Yeah, yeah, no, mountain lions mm -hmm. are not. They're not exactly, uh, they're going to retreat. <laughs> they're going to throw you up your bike and kill you. And you're never going to see them before they see you. Mm -hmm. Alright, let's finish them up. They're beautiful animals. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Hey, thank you. Mm. All right, as um, as people are trickling in and grabbing their lunch, thanks all, to all of you for coming on this beautiful first, the first day of spring. Uh, but today we're going to talk about high throughput screening in the ADD lecture series. So we have Bob Boswick here to uh, teach us about that. He's the, uh, the director of uh, high throughput screening at Southern Research. He's been there for a couple of years. He's been has a experience in high throughput screening for a long time. He's been in AstraZeneca, among others, to uh, direct the high throughput screening efforts there. So he has a lot of experience 
Um, for the people that are uh, logged in online, I'm going to check the chat box afterwards before we close up to see if you have any questions. Um, I'm sure people in the room, Bob will be happy to entertain questions as they arise, so feel free to uh, interject. Uh, so let me minimize the virtual meeting. There you go. And then, uh, Bob, I invite you to come on up. And if you want to point out anything on the screen, go ahead and use the mouse so then people that are logging in remote can also see what you're pointing at. Okay. So, um, I, don't know, I guess this is the fifth or sixth lecture in the series. And I think we're a little bit out of order on yeah. how we usually do it for the drug discovery process. But anyway, I think uh, hopefully I'll put things in context for you. So, as Micah uh, mentioned to you, I'm going to talk about high throughput screening. And it's really exactly what it says, it's, it's high throughput, and the reason is because we do a lot of screening. So this is just the basic outline of the talk. I'm going to talk first about HTS and how it fits in the drug discovery process. Then I'm going to speak a little bit about assay development and optimization that's required uh, in advance of actually running a screen. And then I'll describe the, the actual operational process that we use screening now you've probably seen slides similar to this uh, showing a um, kind of a layout of the different aspects in drug discovery uh, uh, my version of it basically divides it up in three uh, areas one is the hit generation phase the lead generation phase and then the candidate selection phase which then goes off into the clinic so high throughput screening fits in the, the early part the hit generation phase okay and that is basically it's really the, the almost the first thing we do in the process of drug discovery. Of course, usually you identify a target. You have to have some idea of what you're going after, and the target is related to the pathology of whatever disease it is that you're, you want to try to affect pharmacologically. But beyond that, uh, you have to have chemistry involved to make the compounds that ultimately would become a drug. But chemists have to have some, have some knowledge somewhere to start in terms of understanding structures. A lot of times we don't know enough about the target and particularly about the kind of chemistry that interacts with the target to be able to uh, just do de novo synthesis. So that's where high throughput screening comes in. High, high throughput screening is an unbiased approach which basically says if we take a collection of compounds that have drug-like properties and we just test those uh, against an assay that determines uh, whether we're affecting that target then we can identify compounds that, uh, you know, the chemists can use as starting points. Now, high throughput screening is only one tool in a, in, a, in a toolbox of compounds that can be used for that purpose. There's also, particularly if you know uh, enough about the target and you can have some kind of model, uh, like a, say you have a, a, clear, a crystallography structure of the protein that you're interested in, you could, uh, chemists can do virtual screening, uh, they can do um, things what we call affinity screening, which uh, also exploits uh, knowledge of, of the target. All of these basically do structure-based design. That's where you would know maybe you have some information compounds that could could um, hit the target. Anyway, all of these can work in in, in uh, concert with one another, so they're not mutually exclusive. But certainly, I think screening is one of the of the major tools that we use to identify chemical assets. Now, just uh, to orient us, uh, I'm going to use a certain amount, um, type of vocabulary here. When I talk about a hit, I'm talking about a compound that uh, is more than just what comes out of the initial primary screen, but it's actually a compound that gives a validated response in, in the screen. That is one that we know that inhibits an enzyme target, for instance. But to, in order to understand that, a lot of times you have to do secondary assays to confirm that type of activity. So the hits are, are kind of like what is the is kind of the first output of a, of a screen uh, that the chemist can can use. Now a lead is um is developed from hits. Okay, that's why we have a phase we call hit to lead, where the chemists actually start making compounds, and usually uh, they settle in on leads when they know that these compounds are only work in your in vitro assay, but they have some in vivo activity as well. So we try to to um, get that information early on uh, so that the chemists can then start to build in the drug-like properties of compounds that they know will have some 
benefit uh, physiologically. And then the drug candidate is, is the, the compound that ultimately emerges from this process. It's the optimized lead with all the drug-like properties built into it that uh, is then taken into the clinic. <clears throat> okay, uh, now just to flesh out a little bit about the process, uh, so I'm, I've expanded here a little bit about the subcategories in the uh, HIT identification process. Uh, like I said, initially there's the target identification phase, which is what you know your laboratories would be doing. We don't really do that in HTS. We rely on the collaborating investigators to tell us, okay, this is the target of interest. But then beyond that, then uh, we um, will collaborate in terms of developing an assay. Uh, now, most people are knowledgeable about assay development, so we don't have to start from scratch necessarily. However, there are certain requirements that assays have to uh, have in order to perform in high degree screening. Uh, so that's where we'll uh, initially become engaged. Uh, and, and in terms of that, first you have to determine, like, what is the strategy for the assay? How, how are you going to actually um, interrogate your target? And would this assay be feasible in high degree screening? And then uh, once that's set on, then we move into the, the assay development and optimization phase, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And once that's done and the assay is validated to perform in high degree screening, then we move into what's called the active generation phase, which is where the actual primary screen is conducted. And that's where we'll screen hundreds of thousands of compounds to identify those that would be active in the assay. And then, as I mentioned, we will confirm those actives uh, in secondary assays and also assays that are counter screens to eliminate those which have off-target effects. And then uh, transmit that information to the chemist who can then engage in this active to hit phase in terms of expanding the chemical series that are identified. Because what we're actually after here is not to find a drug. We're not even looking for a compound. We're looking for a, a compounds that, that classify together and can, can form what's called a hit series. That is, they have kind of a common structural motif that chemists can look at and determine, well, you know, these are areas of the molecule that can be amenable to changing to make new molecules which could have better properties. So we're really looking for, like I said, chemical series, not just individual hits. So the success of HTS by that measure is that when we identify chemical assets, that can be used as starting points for the lead generation phase. Still got kind of questions, yeah. yeah. So like, for each like, for, for the primary screen, like you have come uh, in the library. So then you do a screen. Uh, like, uh, how many come from? Uh, you know, it varies a lot depending on the assay and, of course, the nature of the, of the collection and, and what your target is, you know. But uh, generally, we look for a hit rate of between 0.2 and, and 1%, okay, of the collection, okay, because if you're less, less than 0.2, then you know, that would indicate that well, maybe we're not screening at a high enough concentration. Uh, and if we're above 1%, then it's, it's the opposite. Maybe we're screening at too high or that the, you know, the assay is such that it's not very, didn't discriminate very well. Um, obviously, you know, sometimes we will fall outside those parameters depending on what like our particular target is. But for the most part, you know, we will find hit rates in that, in that range. Okay, and so kind of, again, tailor the assay and the screening concentration to kind of give us a hit rate like that. The other thing is that we can arbitrarily define what the hits are. You know, where are we going to decide what the activity cutoff threshold is to say whether or not it's a hit. Usually we use some statistical measure for that, but we can also apply, uh, you know, additional, like I say, arbitrary measure. For instance, if we're looking for an enzyme inhibitor, you know, we might say, well, we got a lot of hits here, but we really want things that hit or that inhibit 80% or better. So we might just say, you know, just define the cutoff there. Okay, so HTS, what, what is it? it? It's really a process uh, through which we, again, as I said, interrogate a large number of compounds uh, in in vitro assay. Uh, but that in vitro assay can either detect a phenotypic response or can detect 
you know, the actual engagement of the target of interest. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit too, in terms of the types of assays that we use. But it, it has to be an assay that we can run in hybrid screening. Okay, we do HTS really not so much to find the active compounds as to filter out all the ones that aren't active, because 90, 99 or, or more percent of those compounds aren't going to be what we're looking for. So the first thing to do is just get rid of all of those. Then we get down to a more manageable number that we can uh, assay in, in, in other ways to really hone in on the ones that, that we're interested in. Um, so the way we do hyperprescreen, because we're using, uh, you know, robotic systems, which we have to use, and we're using very small volumes, it's, it's a combination of, of having people that know how to use these robotic systems and also understand the biology and also uh, the management of the compound collections because we have such large compound collections as well as the ability to analyze the data, the large data sets that come out of that. Now this is just a, a list of um, the different projects that we've actually screened in high temperature screening for the ADDA program. I think there's 21 of them up here. We generally run, uh, you know, two to three a year. Some years we ran more, some years we didn't, well, 2015 we didn't run any. But, um, but the reason I'm putting this up here is to give you a sense of that um, we can run both cell and biochemical-based assays in high temperature screening. And these are, we have a, diff a different a collection of toolboxes that were of uh, assay methodologies available to us that in some cases have been specifically designed for hyperbaric screening. Uh, we generally screen about 200,000 compounds uh, more recently. We started off screening maybe about 150, but we upped that to about 200 in the last couple of years. Okay, so that's just kind of an overview. Oh, now I want to talk about what, you know, the components of HTS are. There's basically three major components. First, you need a compound collection. You've got to have something to screen. Okay, but it's more than just, you know, picking just whatever compounds are out there. That's the way it, it first started that way. But uh, after the first five years or so of hyperbaric screening, people realized that there's uh, a lot of reasons not to screen paints and dyes and, you know, compounds that can never become drugs. And it's just, it's an expensive thing to do. And, you know, but garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you don't really design your compound collection, uh, you're probably not going to get very good uh, output. So... It's not enough just to screen. You've got to really think about, you know, watering your screen. So over the years, what we've done is we've kind of evolved in terms of our thinking of the compound collection. And basically what we want are compounds. First of all, we want to have diversity of chemical structure within the with drug-like properties. So there's a certain chemical space that, uh, you know, you want to be in, but you want to be as diverse in that space as possible. But you also want to have compounds that have similarities to each other so that they do form little clusters within those spaces. Because again, it, it, it's really the value of hyperbaric screening is not to identify a single compound, it's truly really to identify a compound series. So you need more than one of the same type of compound in order to do that. Uh, so that, therefore we have multiple representatives of, of the compounds with the same cluster in the collection. Now optimally, for a collection of about a million compounds, uh, we would have 50,000 clusters, each with about 20 representatives in, in each cluster. Okay, uh, That way, if you screen 20 representatives uh, in HTS, you're almost certain to find uh, all of the clusters that have some activity. You won't find all the compounds in every cluster, but you'll find enough of them that you can identify the cluster. Okay, then the second component is the assay. You need an assay that's a minimal to hyperbaric screening. And when we say hyperbaric screening, that means we want to test at least 32,000 compounds a day. And actually, that's a little bit on the low side now, but that's kind of what we, what we typically do. And that means that the, auto, that the assay has to be automation friendly. So we run it in the microtiter place, the 384 and the 1536 uh, standard microtiter plate formats. That means they have to be compatible with liquid handling systems and compatible with the compound library format. So all of our libraries are in, in those plates, and we can easily transfer compounds from those source plates into the asset plates with the liquid handling systems we have. It has to be cost effective because if you're screening 200,000 compounds, you don't want it to cost a million dollars. So we try to hold it down to um, 
it's still over a hundred thousand dollars but it's not you know it's not unrealistic and then finally it has to be robust that is we want a large signal window with low variability and i'll explain why that's important and then the third component is informatics because obviously we're generating a lot of data hundreds of thousands of data points sometimes millions of data points uh it's of course very difficult to visually you know in, uh, look and inspect all of that data so we need informatics systems that enable us to do that and also not only to determine what's active and what isn't active but how the assays perform as we go through. So we have various um, um, informatics platforms. ActivityBase is our main database platform. It's all Oracle based but ActivityBase is the, is the front end that the, that the uh, uh, experimenter looks at to look at the data and, and how we interrogate the data. Dotmatics is a system that the chemists use where they can see all the data related to the various chemical structures that we have that are also registered in the database. And then we, of course, all of our data goes into uh, email books and we have um, a LIM system for tracking uh, all the components of the assays that goes through and also um, the tools like Pipeline Pilot to help us uh, analyze the data. Okay, so in terms of uh, actually running HTS, there's uh, several steps along the way. First, of course, is the asset development and optimization. And that's a really key component in high throughput screening because uh, if you don't have a good assay, then you're, you're not going to be able to run your screen or you're not going to get the data out of the screen. So it really uh, pays to spend a lot of time developing and optimizing the assay. In fact, sometimes we spend more time doing that than we do running the screen. Because once you get the assay working and you know it works well, then, then running the screen is just like turning the crank and you can really, really spit out the data pretty quick if it performs, you know, uh, routinely just very, you know, very well. But, um, so that, so that we spend a lot of time on. Then, of course, we validate the assay to know that it will run in, in the HTS mode. And that means that we put it on the robotics systems and we actually run it as if we were running a screen to make sure that we've got all the timings down, that the um, instrumentation is working properly, that we don't have any you know, hang-ups, because we don't want to launch into you know, a full-scale screen and then, and then start discovering these kind of issues. So we'll just do you know, a few plates, but do them as if we were running it in high throughput screening to work out those uh, issues. And then um, before we launch the big-scale screen, then we actually will screen a collection of compounds, but just limit it to 10,000 compounds. So that's what we'll do 5,000, depending on, again, the assay. And we'll run this twice, okay? So the purpose of that is to show that not only is the assay, again, performing when we actually screen a collection, but that we get re reproducible results. So we will actually take that data and compare the, the data from both runs uh, against each other, and then we can determine whether we've got the, the kind of correlation that we need to launch forward into the, into the big screen. So the primary screen, as I mentioned, can be, you, we usually do between 200 and 800,000 compounds. For ADDA projects, it's usually on the lower end of that, about 200,000. Um, following the primary screen, then we do hit selection, which I'll explain about. That's actually, you know, what compounds we want to retest. We confirm those in a retest, and then we give that information to chemistry, so they triage them. They do cluster analysis and so forth, and so they can, you know, kind of put their eye to it to say, okay, well, these are the structures that we're really the most interested in pursuing. And so then those compounds will be selected for further secondary screens, usually going back to the investigator lab, such as your labs, uh, to just to confirm that, that uh, we got the biology correct, that these compounds are in fact affecting the type of biology that, that we want them to. And then once we have all that in place, then the medicinal chemists can launch into their, into their efforts. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about assay and assay development. So there's basically two strategies uh, that we can employ when we're talking about assays. One is you can have a phenotypic assay, and, and we do a lot of these. These are usually these are cell-based assays, um, and we what we see in these assays is we get some kind of physiological readout or response. It's usually uh, it can be a reporter response or it can be a, a viability of the cell, for instance cell viability assay, the, but what we don't know there is what the actual drug target is. We don't know what the drug is actually interacting with at the molecular level. We know the 
the outcome of that. We can say we want a drug that, you know, kills cancer cells. So we can measure that, you know, but we don't know how it's doing that, okay, in that assay. But we can still use it to screen. On the other side, though, is, is uh, having a targeted assay, which can be run as either a biochemical or a cell-based assay. In this case, we do know what the target is. And uh, that's, there's a big advantage to, to doing it that way because that it really helps out the chemists a lot, too. But, um, but it doesn't have to be that way, but that's, that's really kind of the preferred, preferred way if you know what your target is. Uh, and in that case, then the readout does measure you know, drug uh, interaction with the target. So that would be like a binding assay or an enzyme assay or even receptor assays in cells. Now, these two approaches can be actually, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. We often do combine them. Uh, because the thing about a targeted assay, particularly if it's biochemical, we can measure drug target interaction, but we still don't know what it does physio in a physiological system. So you still want to validate those compounds in an assay, in a cell-based assay, to show that it, it, it's affecting the biology that you want. So uh, just to compare and contrast the biochemical versus cell-based assays, biochemical assays are usually relatively simple assays to set up and very straightforward. And we can get very consistent reproducible results with those uh, because it's just reagents that we're mixing together. And we do get a drug measurement of target engagement of the drug with the target, uh, which allows us to also drive the, um, the potency of those compounds toward the target so that you can end up with compounds that are very specific for that, that target interaction. So for instance, we can measure the important key components like, like the KI of, a, of an inhibitor for an enzyme or the KD for binding. Um, the disadvantage of that, as I mentioned, is it's not really a physiological assay, so you still have to have, to have another assay to, to, to show you that. And it's really not sensitive to other properties of compounds that may be important, for instance, you know, whether they can cross a, a cell membrane a barrier or whether they're toxic to the cells. Now, on the other hand, cell-based assays, you know, will pick those up. You know, you can know right off the bat whether your compound, you know, if it's an intracellular target, you know, with, whether it's getting into the cell and having an effect, and if it's physiologically relevant. But on the other side, the disadvantages are that, again, you don't necessarily know uh, that you're measuring an interaction with the target that you're interested in. And it's usually a more complex assay because you've got all the conditions of growing the cells and culturing them, and maintaining them, and making sure they're consistent from batch to batch to batch. So it really adds a lot of complexity to the assay. There tends to be a lot of noise in cell-based assays that we have to contend with. And um, um, also, there's some solubility issues that can come into play because the, of the media and the assay conditions are, are much more restricted in cell-based assays. Um, okay, now just to talk a little bit about some of the, some of the readouts that we use. Um, the, usually, a readout in hyperbit screening is going to be uh, 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 light, so it's either going to be fluorescence luminescence or absorbance, something like that. Doesn't always have to be, but that's typically what most uh, HTS assays uh, do and almost all the ones that we run. So a fluorescence assay, of course, is based on the um, excitation of the fluorophore. So you have to introduce the fluorophore in your assay. A lot of times this is uh, uh, done in assays that are proximity assays like uh, fluorescence energy transfer assays or time resolve threat, or forces polarization assays. All these assays basically rely on the, um, the engagement of, uh, or the labeling of a protein or your, or your target, doesn't necessarily have to be protein, it usually is, with a fluorescent tag. And then you measure the um, change in fluorescence when your drug or your compound interacts with that target. So like if it's forces polarization, for instance, what you'd have is you'd have your, your binding partner to, say, a peptide labeled with a, a fluorescent probe, and your compound would block the binding of that fluorescent containing molecule to your target. So uh, you get a change in, in the millipede signal in your assay. So it's just, it's just a way of determining whether or not uh, you can 
affect the uh, drug target interaction, at least in a, in a biochemical assay. Um, so, and, uh, yeah. Great question. So, when, but my one experience with, with HTS, we had a, a, a fluorescence based readout for an enzyme activity where the product was fluorescent. Um, and we ended up finding mostly fluorescence quenchers. Yeah. Is that uh, typical. Right. It, it is something that you will find, yeah. And, and not only that, but all kinds of autofluorescence, too. Can give you, it depends on which way you're looking at your signal, you want an increase or decrease in fluorescence. So that's a disadvantage of, um, of fluorescence assays, and um, you have to counter screen uh, to detect compounds that do that. But it's, it's usually a pretty simple counter screen to determine that. So it's not insurmountable, and uh, it's and we usually, that's the first thing we do after we, you know, identify the distance of the counter screen is we set up a counter screen to measure exactly those types of off-target or non-target related responses to eliminate those compounds. But that is a liability with fluorescence assays. The, um, um, the other way, another assay format that we use is um, it's called alpha screen technology. And this is actually generates a luminescent signal, but it's very similar to some of the other types of fluorescent proximity assays. By proximity, I mean when you bring two uh, uh, fluorophores or two uh, uh, molecules into close proximity to each other and you excite one, then it will cause a change in the light output of the other one, whether it's fluorescence or infrared or in the case of alpha screen, it's a luminescent signal. And the way alpha screen works is, um, is that you excite the, the chemistry in the uh, what's called the donor bead, when you're excited at 680, it produces a singlet oxygen, which then has a chemical reaction with a series of compounds in the in the acceptor bead. Okay, and then that will produce light uh, in, in the, the 520 to the 620 nanometer range. Okay. How expensive is this kind of this, So this is um this is on the high side. The beads are pretty expensive, but they're not prohibitively expensive. Um, and then we do a lot of alpha screen actually. So you know, we, you know, and we, because we do volumes, and the, usually we try to run these in 1536-core format, so we can really reduce the volumes and, and reduce the, the usage of, of those. Like AP, I'm at the hospital, yeah. protein domain. So what's the range of this AP, like the amino acid? Yeah, so, so the A and B here just stand for, you know, two molecules that interact. I mean, it can be an antibody antigen, or it can be protein-protein interaction or whatever, it, it just has to bring these two beads in close enough proximity and it's usually, you know, about 200 nanometers. In order for this, the oxygen to uh, react with the, the donor bead, because it, it, this, this species only lasts for about 400 microseconds, so if they're not in close proximity to each other, then you, you don't get the chemical reaction. So my understanding is that it's smaller the beta uh, so what's important in this assay is the is the proximity of the beads. Okay, mm -hmm. so you can have large molecular weight components here. Uh, they, they don't necessarily have to be small. Now, for fluorescence polarization, you do want your fluorescently tagged molecule to have a, a certain, you know, maximum molecular weight. Usually, we like it to be on the low side, just like a peptide or something, you know, because uh, that involves um, the, the the ability of the, of the molecule to to freely tumble in solution, but this this assay is not that critical. So when we're looking at protein protein interactions, you know, this is a preferred format, uh, you know, for that because we can, you know, we can, we're not limited by the size of the molecules, provided that it can bring the beads into close enough proximity. Yeah, I think we have one example, maybe for a neighbor screen, where we had both beads had at least an antibody in there, and I think one had a protein A label with an antibody connected to that that then bound to one of the components. The other B had an antibody about something else. So there was there's a lot of stuff yeah. that can be in between those Bs. Like with the FRET, it needs to be really small and close together. This can be much larger. I think it's, no, I think I'll, no, I have a very small FRET. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's okay with me. Oh, yeah, it'll work. It'll work for that, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 This works for, I mean, you can, people have set up assays to measure cyclic KMP levels, you know, because you, you have a biotinylated cyclic KMP, say your A part, and then you have an antibody to cyclic KMP. It will bring the two Bs together, and then you measure 
cyclic AMP that's produced out of a cell lysate, and it, 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 it'll block that interaction. So you can have very small. Yeah, and small is no problem, but how big it's a protein company? Well, I would say, it, it, because proteins fold up and they, oh, and yeah. they move in space, okay. as long as the two beads come close enough together. So structure is yeah. no yeah. problem. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so a little bit about cell-based assays, you know, what kind of assays do we run there? We can, of course, look at cell proliferation, we look at cell viability, we can even look at the, the, the cells to migrate across the plate. Uh, we look at reporter genes in, in cell-based assays, we can look at mRNA levels with qPCR and protein expression, of course, okay? Uh, so these are typically assays that we uh, do and have run in hyper screening. And, and, and just these pictures, for instance, so this is a, an example of what we would kind of see in a cell corporation assay. We would simply label, uh, you know, the nucleus of a cell, so we would just count that. Or we look at, say, uh, cell viability. We do this a lot in our, our virus work, where we infect host cells with the virus. The virus kills the host cell. If we have a drug that kills the virus and the virus doesn't kill the host cell, so now you don't, you know, see the host cell dying. So here's, like this would be, um, you know, host cells that are not infected with the virus, host cells that are infected with the virus, and then host cells infected with the virus in the presence of, a, of an antiviral agent. Okay. Now, uh, we, uh, reporter assays, you can run this as uh, either fluorescent or luminescence. This cartoon describes a luminescent reporter assay with the reporter being cyperase, which is an enzyme that, that um, um, generates light from the um, uh, the transformation of the substrate luciferin. Uh, you can also have, uh, say, a, a green fluorescent protein or yellow fluorescent protein for a, a fluorescent protein readout here. We like we like luminescence though because um, typically these give brighter signals than fluorescence assays. Plus, it avoids the, some of the quenching problems that we mentioned about that of uh, having fluorescently quenched uh, quenching agents. Uh, but um, <coughs> Uh, this assay is um, is pretty straightforward in terms of the setup because usually uh, you make you make a construct uh, downstream with the luciferase gene downstream of, of a promoter, uh, and when that's introduced into a cell, of course, the luciferase is uh, produced. It generates um, enough enzyme that when you add the substrate, you, you get the lights of it. And you can use this to either measure compounds that activate the reporter, or you can you look for compounds that, uh, you know, shut it off. Okay, so it can go either way. It just depends on, you know, if you have the ability to get constitutive acti activity of the reporter expression. Now, a lot of times investigators will also introduce a second uh, transcript with Renilla uh, luciferase as opposed to the Firefly luciferase. And this could be used as a control agent so that if you look for a compound that affects uh, the readout of this reporter, gene but has no effect on the on the Renella reporter gene, uh, then that's used as, a, as an internal control. For either screening, that's not so useful to us. We actually uh, don't even usually look at the Renella signal if we get a cell line like that. The reason is because it's also possible to find compounds that can inhibit, can inhibit luciferase activity itself. So what we would prefer to do is to have a cell line, have two cell lines, one with, uh, you know, this construct is your target, and then the other one, which would have some other promoter, Lucifer is under the control of some other promoter, that's not your target. So we can counter screen the hits from the first, the primary screen, against the cell line of the secondary screen, and if we see a decrease in Lucifer's activity, you know, we know it's, it's an off-target effect. Does your database keep track of, for example, scoring things? Is this one has, is potentially a Lucifer inhibitor, this one quenches GFP? Uh, we, I would, I, I'd say we capture that data, but we don't, it's not, um, yeah, it's it's not something that we really annotate. Um, I mean, I guess, I mean, we don't really analyze it that way. We just, because every assay is different, okay? So every cell is different, you know, and, and so it's really better to just, you know, empirically just determine, you know, which hits are going to are going to actually affect your particular assay rather than just saying, oh, well, you know, here's this, this compound, you know, is false positive in four or five assays, which, I mean, that's useful information, but we always just go ahead and test it. We don't just rely on the historical data for that. 
Okay, just a couple other uh, assay formats. One is called laser scanning cytometry. This one looks at fluorescence in cells, uh, and we use this a lot to look for either uh, uh, expression of a reporter, a fluorescent reporter, or we can look for um, cell surface uh, proteins, or even, even non-cell surface proteins if we fix and stain the cells. Uh, but it, it generally, you look for you, uh, you know, fluorescence signal that um, is somehow tagged to your protein of interest, so that if, uh, say, um, you have an antibody that is fluorescent tagged, then you can measure your, your protein of interest, okay? Uh, so it's a lot like um, an ELISA assay, except that in this format, you don't have to have all the washing steps that you have with ELISA. Or it's like a cell, like a, a flow cytometry assay, okay? But again, it's plate-based. Uh, we don't have to wash. We don't have to do any separation steps. We can simply measure the, the number of fluorescent events in a well, okay? Because the laser okay. raster scans okay. at the bottom of the plate. Yeah. So for the first one, for secondary type assay, you actually don't need the triplicate necklace sensor. No. Okay. You know, yeah. No. You, because the because you get a, it's basically an image of each okay. well, okay. and it discriminates the objects. So it can discriminate the cells in the well that are fluorescing, and so you can actually count, you know, the number of fluorescent events and how intense that fluorescence is, and that can be a, an index, a measure of, of your protein expression, for instance. Can you only do Mirabel with um, or this with adherent cells? Um, no, not. I mean, uh, well, it, it only scans the bottom of the plate. I mean, mm -hmm. so long as I mean, it does work better with adherent cells, but. Uh, you could, you know, you could fix cells, of course, or you could just let them settle. Yeah, spin yeah. them down and just look at the, the bottom of the plate. Okay. That's the main thing. The other way is that we uh, actually pioneered a lot of this is QPCR for height of screening. Okay, we're able to do QPCR in 1536 volt format, which puts us down into a, a, an affordable range uh, to do it. And, and so we've used this um, a lot to look for, um, you know, gene expression in, in. Uh, the several assays uh, that we're running for several targets, but in particular for viruses, we're mainly interested in, in using this as a, as a surrogate for virus titer. And so it could be a much more sensitive assay uh, in that regard than, than some of the other more conventional assays. So I just want to move on now to the HTS part since that was my little assay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, so now you've got your assay, you know, you've got an assay format that you know works in HTS, but you're not quite there yet because even though you can set it up on the bench top, you know, and, and usually we, you know, assays do start kind of in this format, we got to get them to work on the robots, okay? So going from here to here is, 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 is really quite different in terms of how assays perform and what, what you need to pay attention to. So, of course, in order to work on robotic platforms, the, all the assays have to be performed in microtire plates because that's what the robot moves around, okay? And that's really... Pretty much all the robot does. It just moves the plate from one station to the other, and then the, the instruments on the peripherals do all the work. Um, so we have a choice, you know, different uh, density of, of plates that we can do. A lot of a lot of assays start off in 96 volt formats, but we prefer to run in 3 to 4 or 15 36 volt formats. There's also a 3 4 5 6 plate format, but uh, the liquid handling systems are not really precise enough to run at sub microliter volumes that are required for these assays. So you have to run a lot of replicates here. You might as well just back up and down in fifteen thirty six. That's what we typically do. So almost all of our biochemical assays are run in fifteen thirty six. Um, and about half of our cell based assays are either fifteen thirty six, the other half are thirty four. Okay. And that only us to screen thirty to hundred thousand compounds a day. So one one problem I have encountered with evaporation. So if I'm right. growing cells in a dish with small right. volumes and I stick it in the incubator, uh, I assume you don't want to, but how do you deal with that? that so, and so that's why um, we only run about half of our cell base assays in 1536 because the evaporation is a problem, but we can go about 24 hours before that becomes uh, an issue. So if we have a 24 hour assay, a lot of reporter assays uh, are just 24 hour readouts. We can do it in 1536. But if it's cell viability assay or proliferation assay or something we're going to have to go for three, four, five days, then we run those in 384, which um, we can run, and we usually run those in about 30 microliters. And these are sitting in the incubator at the, the humidity is really high in the incubator. It's like 
well over 90 percent. So yeah. uh, that that maintains the you know it helps keep the evaporation effects under control. Okay, so in, in addition to determining the plate type, and it's not just the, the density, but it's also the plastic. The, the type of bind you have low bind, high bind plastics, clear bottom, opaque bottom. You know whatever your assay requires, that there's a, usually a plate for that. Uh, but then we also have to determine DMSO tolerance of the acid. That's because all the compounds are dissolved in 9% DMSO. So we're going to add the compounds to the acid in DMSO. So we've got to know how much how much DMSO will the acid tolerate. Usually we're doing a 1 to 1,000 dilution. Our, our compound collections uh, typically maintain it at a 10 millimolar stock solution. We do a 1 to 1,000 dilution in the acid. We're down to 0.1% DMSO. Almost all acids will tolerate that. Uh, but cell-based assays, you, we really don't like to go more than 0.2% DMSO because then you start seeing effects. Sometimes you could push it to 0.5%, but definitely not really beyond that. Now, some biochemical assays, you can go 1-2% DMSO, not a problem. But typically, you know, we want to be as low as we as we can, but we still have to know what the limits are of the assay for that. Uh, then, of course, we have to characterize our reagents. Uh, you know, we need to know how stable they are, if it's an enzyme, you know, how stable is it? not only under storage conditions, but also during the acid, because an assay run can last for three, four, five hours. You know, is your enzyme going to hold up during that time frame at the temperature that you're running it at to be able to, you know, make sure your first plate and your last plate, you know, give you the same data. So we have to work that out before you, you set it up, um, how it's pre-incubated, and then also the quantity of the, of the reagents, because particularly when you're talking about proteins, uh, you know, you have to produce a lot of it before you launch into screen because you don't want to get a third of the way into it and then run out of that protein and then make up a new batch and then everything's different. Again. So you don't want to have to go back and recharacterize everything. You want to try to produce enough protein or whatever reagent you're using to get through the whole screen in, in one batch. Then we have to work out the uh, how we add the reagents. You know, um, Obviously we just want to add them, mix them, and read it. We don't want to do separation and wash steps. So mix and read homogenous assays work best. The order of addition sometimes is important. Uh, and the number of additions uh, also is important. We typically don't want to do more than about three additions. Uh, and then also the volume that we run the acid in. So like I said, in 1536, it's, it can be you know, less than a microliter, although using one to 10 microliters. 3 to 4, it's, it's usually you know, 5 to 30 or so. Cell supply, of course, if you're, it's a cell-based assay, you have to understand the growth characteristics of the cells. We want to run the assays when the cells are in log phase growth. Um, you have to be able to scale up that cell supply and supply it to the screen as it as it is ongoing for over several weeks. So you have to know, you know, when, how long can you pass into cells when you have to start up a new bottle, and so forth. So one way to get around that is, of course, is to use cryo preserve cells. That is, cells you can grow up a big batch, freeze back aliquots of those cells, and then just take them straight out of the freezer put them into the assay. That works great when it works, but it doesn't always work. So we, we like to at least explore that, uh, you know, before we run the screen, because if, it, if it's an option, then we, we definitely want to go for that. Then we have to measure assay performance. So because what we're aiming for is that we, we're going to test each compound one time at a single concentration. Okay, so we want to have a high confidence that if it's an active compound, we're going to find it. And if it's not active, you know, we're not going to so in order to, to have that level of confidence, the assay has to be very robust. So initially we look at, at things like the, the signal to background ratio. We like the ratios that are greater than five. Uh, signal to noise is another way to kind of look at that, define that assay window. Uh, we, uh, that also incorporates the variability. We look at percent CVs. Usually if you have a, a, an SB of five, you want a CV, percent CV of, of less than 10. Um, and then we also look at reproducibility. You know, not just it's well to well, plate to plate, day to day reproducibility, because these these assays will run all, again over weeks, and we want to know that we get the same data every time we run it. So, how do you then know if your assay is in fact ready for each test? Well, we have a, a statistical measure that we rely on heavily called the Z factor, and basically the Z factor is simply defined as a way to determine whether your signals, uh, your signal from your say your test compound and your your control are sufficiently separated 
to know that if you if you get a, a signal, whether it's part of this population or part of that population. Okay, so you, you want to know whether it's active or not. That's what we're looking for. So you, so these so the population of these signals have to be sufficiently separated uh, so that they don't really overlap. Okay. So the way to measure that is you look at the, at the differences in the means of those two signal populations and you incorporate the variability or you know, the standard deviation around each of those signals and you apply it to this formula to get the z-factor. And basically the way it works out is that a z-factor between uh, or greater than 0.5 means that your assay is robust. You've got good separation between these uh, two populations. Now this d defines the uh, a sample population. When we run our assays, we always can include positive and negative controls on every single plate that we run. Okay, and when you're comparing the difference or the, the separation of the bands between the positive and the negative controls, then we call that the z prime factor. Okay, so we will report a z prime factor for every plate that we run in the high screen, and we want that factor to be greater than 0.5. If it's less than that, then we, you know, we'll go back and, and retest the compounds on that. Okay, so the pilot screen is again now we're ready to run the screen. We take 10,000 compounds that are diverse, that are representative of the collection, and we'll run those in the assay. And then, um, and then we'll do it um, twice. Okay, so the reason for that is because we want to, it'll again tell us how reproducible our assay is. If the compound hits the first time, does it hit the second time, and does it get the same signal? So we'll actually. Um, develop a correlation curve to show that all of our all of the data for those 10, those 20,000 data points you know will correlate with one another. Now as we mentioned earlier we can also get an early look at what our expected hit rate is going to be in the screen by doing this. And if we're seeing hit rates higher than than we want then we can adjust our screening concentration you know lower so that we're not going to pick up as many hits. If we, if we don't see enough we might up the screening concentration or might change some other parameter, maybe the time, the, the length of incubation time in the assay or something else in order to, to adjust that. So it also gives us kind of a final look at, you know, do we have everything, all of our conditions uh, set. So this is uh, some example data of two 10K runs that were run on two separate days and we correlate the data and you can see on the panel A that uh, we are getting, uh, you know, good correlation. I mean, they don't, you know, of course, they're not going to line up perfectly but it's still, it's a good correlation of the data from run one to two. But here's an example where we didn't get a good correlation. So something was obviously wrong with the data. We were getting hits, but they weren't the same compounds hitting. So, so these were all just false positives. And we only had a few compounds that actually were produced. So we had to go back and rework this assay. So that's a final check then again on assay performance. But once everything's set, and, we, and then the 10K screen works and everything's working, then we're ready to launch the primary screen. So, as I mentioned before, we test each compound once at a single concentration. This is our typical plate layout for a three to four wall plate, where we have, um, you know, we have, uh, say, uh, negative controls on this side and positive controls on this side, and then we'll reserve some wells for a reference compound if we, if we have that available to us. Uh, so that every plate would look like this. So we actually only screen 320 compounds per plate, these, these inner wells, in a three to four wall plate. So we have 32, you know, positive and negative controls on every plate. And, that, and you need a large number of controls in order to calculate your Z, Z prime factor. You know, two or three wells won't do it. We need, you know, because you're looking at population differences. Okay, so then when we screen, then this is kind of, this is a heat map of, of what we may typically see in a screen. So um, basically, um, Say, say these are your positive controls here and your negative controls over here, then a compound that gives you the effect will, will light up, basically, in this, in this uh, pseudo-color map. And depending on what the threshold is, you know, we've got maybe two or four hits on a plate, and that's kind of typically what you want to see. You don't want to see the whole plate hitting. You know, you just want to see, you know, a few compounds. Maybe, you know, more than four is actually kind of high. Because the idea is that all the compounds are randomly distributed into the collection. Even compounds that have similar structures, you don't want them all in the same plate. You want them on different plates. Uh, we recently ran into a screen in one of our, in, in Sumo, uh, where we had all these nucleosides on one plate. 
and all of them hit because uh, they were interfering with the ATP uh, response signal in the assay, and uh, you, you just kind of you know so we can't you know it's meaningless data. We know okay nucleosides might be good uh, compounds, but it, it couldn't discriminate you know hits from non hits in that case. So most of the content percent, you have to get. No, no, these are all just, just, one, just one time. One, one compound, one. One compound, one time. Percent and one. Yeah. Yeah. And and the reason yeah and the reason for that is because. You know, we what we want to screen are as many different kinds of compounds as we can. As I mentioned, we've got compounds that are similar to each other. It's better to screen, say, ten compounds that are similar than three compounds, you know, three times, you know, because we're looking for the chemical series. And we don't know, you know, like there may be some aspects of a, of a structural series that prevent the cell, the compound from getting into the cell in one case, but not in the other. So you you want to give yourself you know, the maximum chance of finding the series. So better to screen more representatives of, of a chemical class rather than, you know, fewer representatives multiple times. And also you have increasing concentration. So if you get any signal, so you get increased signal. We do that as a follow-up. We will validate. Follow but this is just, we just screen initially in a oh, relatively, one, 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 one. yeah, and it's a relatively high concentration, you know, right. you know 10 micromolar or so. Okay. Yeah. So this is how we look at the data. Uh, after we run the screen, or while we're running the screen, in fact, this is data for for an entire screening set, uh, and I guess it represents about 780 plates. So these are positive and negative controls, just plotted uh, on a graph. And so what you can see is that we've got signal window for every plate. This is this is the data for every plate with error bars around the controls. These are the positive and negative controls of every plate. And you can see that even though it changes, you know, day to day, batch to batch. We've still got a pretty good signal window, and in fact, when we transform it into the Z prime data, we can see that that most of them are up around 0.8, which is was good. There's a few that that were below that, but they were still above 0.5. So, so that meets our threshold for asset performance. And we say, okay, well, all the data, at least from that perspective, is good, and we can select hits from that. Now, the data that's generated from these plates, then of course, goes into our database and that's where we do all the statistical analysis but at the same time we normalize the data relative to those controls so that we can because because those signals will vary from plate to plate, to plate we want to really look at, at things how compounds perform relative to the controls on that plate so we convert everything to percent response of those controls and we store that information in our database and then we associate that with the compound ID, which is also sort because all the plates are barcoded we know exactly what every plate is and what's in every well of every plate. And then we can statistically analyze it to determine what uh, what our hits are. Now the way we do that is we simply look at the population distribution of all the data. Okay. Now as I mentioned before, 99% or more of the, of the compounds should not be active in the assay. That means that basically that this, this data should be Gaussian distribution if it's well performed and the mean of that all that data should basically be zero percent effect. You know, it should have no effect. Okay, and that's typically what we see. If we see something deviates from that very, very much, then we know something was skewed in the assay, you know, in terms of our controls. They weren't performing. They weren't performing. Sometimes we can use actually you, instead of using a negative control, you can use the, the, the compound test well data as your negative control. Because as I mentioned, almost all of those compounds are not going to be active and they should be the same as your negative control. And that's what this analysis will tell us. Now at the same time, the data will distribute and it's Gaussian. That means that if we're through out three standard deviations from this, this mean, zero effect mean, that we're down at um, you know around 0.1% of the compounds. That's where our hits should be. Okay? So what we generally do is we, we calculate the mean of all the data and then we to go three standard deviations away from that mean in the positive direction where we want our effect to be. And those are the compounds that we'll say that meet the statistical cutoff as an active compound. So that's our first cut in terms of how we're going to define what's a hit or not. Now, the thing is it's important to retest those hits though when you when you take them. And then, here's the reason. Because particularly if you're screening a large number of compounds, let's like say we screen 800,000 compounds, then just from that Gaussian distribution of data, of, of negative control data, if you, you know, 
test something 8,000 times, it's going to have that distribution. And there's going to be some three standard deviations away from that, you know, some, some compounds. And even if it's, it's 0.0015% of that, it's still 1,200 compounds out of a set of 1,800, okay? So a large number of those hits from the statistical cutoff are, are, are not real hits. So you have to retest your hits. But when you retest them, it's going to be the same distribution. The real hits are going to continue to show up. Three standard deviations are like the mean. But the ones that weren't were just statistical flukes. They're going to redistribute back. And they're going to have, you know, they're going to center around zero. And so you're going to eliminate all those in your retest. So it's not uncommon when we retest hits that half or more of the compounds fall out. It's just because it's a statistical noise when we're doing large data sets screening. But that's why it's important to do that. Okay, but once we determine what our, you know, our kind of our true hits are, at least uh, statistically, then we go back and we do what we call cherry pick. We go back into the source plates where the compounds are, and we'll actually pick out that sample of, the, of those compounds, and we will uh, collect them all into a new plate, a new source plate. Okay, then we'll take that source plate, and we'll, if we fill up a whole plate, so say we get 320 hits, per plate. Then what we'll do is we'll take that source plate and we'll do serial two-fold dilutions in like a Z, what we call a Z stack, okay? So we can actually then test all 10 plates. We can get a full dose response curve for 320 compounds in that stack of 10 plates. And then since all the data is going to the database, we can simply reconstruct or construct our dose response curve uh, from that data. And we can determine IC50 or EC50 values, whatever it is. And that gives us an index of potency of the compounds and also efficacy too. So that's that that is our retest format. Okay. Yes. Yes. And so if we if we if we need a counter screen in a different cell line then we will test all those hits in that counter screen at the same time. So we'll do parallel assays and we'll do a dose response for all the compounds in all the different counter screens. So we might have three or four different assays that we use, but we'll get dose response curve for all the compounds and all those assays to be able to distinguish you know, which ones are you know, hitting the mechanism that we want versus whether it's a cytotoxic effect or some kind of off-target that quenching effect or something like that. Yeah. So that's that's actually the head validation phase. So that's down here, you know, so that so that we, we want to eliminate compounds that interfere, say, with the detection system, like it's a force of compounds, or compounds that have off-target effects in a cell-based assay, or even a biochemical assay you know, that have off-target effects. Any anything that you know can can reduce or increase the signal in the assay, but it doesn't have anything to do with with the biological mechanism. That's what we try to eliminate in the in the counter screen. So that compounds that pass through that we call them valid hits. Okay, so they've confirmed and retest and then they're validated in the, by the counter screens and sometimes the secondary screen. So once we have that, then we can give that information over to the chemist and say, okay, now we've identified these hit clusters. And they can, again, triage based on the structural information that they get from that, and they do their cluster analysis stuff, and they say, we like these 10 clusters of compounds. Okay, so we might take representative samples of those 10 clusters, because now we've gone from, say, 200,000 compounds down to maybe 1,000 hits, down to maybe 200 validated hits. Now we've got to get them down to maybe a couple of dozen compounds that can go back into, into your labs to test in your more mechanistically defined assays to confirm whether they, in fact, are hitting, you know, the, having the biological effect that you want, and hopefully you can show target engagement for that. So that's what this triage and then uh, is all about, so we can get the number down so they can go back into the more defined secondary assays. And then from that, then, you know, the chemist then will say, okay, well, these are the ones that are actually working the best, and these are the chemical scaffolds that we like, and then they can start designing new molecules and actually making new molecules. And that's when they get into the chemistry of it. So once the chemistry effort starts up, then that's when, you know, my job is done. 
in terms of HTS, you know, they've got the app where they've got something to work with, and we go on to the next thing. Okay, while well, they spend the next five years trying to get a confident into the clinic, you know. So, so that's, you know, basically it in a nutshell. I just want to put this slide up just to give you the names of people who are um, in the HTS group for SR uh, in case you, uh, you know, ever do interact with us in our regular SMA. Of course, I'm Bob Boss again. It's my contact information. You can email me uh, with questions or if you ever want to collaborate, you know, do some, we've done some, several collaborations. I'm happy to do it. Check in the chat box real quick. One of the questions from the web. In the meantime, anybody here? So you have self uh, self and your uh, self biability as self is basically kind of access analysis of where that is. Say that again. Can you self yeah. 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 And also you have viability. Right. So self polyperson as that is based on kind of access analysis. Yeah, so there, you know, we, what we do is like we stay, we sell nucleus or something, and we get a cell count. Yeah, okay. And you can measure, like, say, when you plate the cells, and then three days later, you know, how many how many cells you have there. I mean, that's one way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. But only if you want to target, like, cell proliferation or not, is there any assay? But just to count the nuclei, that's what they can do. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that doesn't or, necessarily involve so how healthy the cells yeah. are, just that there is a cell. Right. And maybe... Yeah, viability assays, we'll there's look there's at, there's at there's the, there's the there's metabolic there's state there's of the cell, there's and, there's yeah, there's yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah, we usually measure ATP levels for viability yeah. assays. Yeah. Or Almar group is another way, which measures the metabolic state of the cells, as opposed to just rank cell number. Great, thank you. Um, we'll put these slides up on the website. Uh, I still owe you a chemistry slide. She sent them to me and she's like, no, I want to cheat something. And then she left out. So, <laughs> but, you the website? Yeah, on the ADD website. Mm -hmm. ADD website, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you just Google ADDA, UAV, usually it pops up. So it should be pretty easy. But it, it may take a few days, sometimes yeah. a week. But yeah. Fine, yeah. yeah. So, and if you haven't done so yet, make sure you sign in on the sign-in sheet. Oh, they're on the table over there. And next week we have a break, and then uh, the week after that we're going to talk about IND applications. Should I close this down? Yeah, that's from this section. Stop recording.